and I believe we are officially on air. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, uh, always within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Kafedzis, a former master's student in Thomas Euler's lab, and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin uh, by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this very initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible uh, seminar world. Having said that, uh, please allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from Lund University, Professor Eric Warrant. Following a honors degree in physics at the University of South Wales, he went on and obtained his PhD in visual sciences from the Australian National University in Canberra by studying the optics of arthropod superposition eyes. Uh, an invitation in 1990 from Dan Nilsson took him to Sweden and Lund University at the time as a postdoctoral fellow and since 2002, if I remember correctly, as a professor of zoology. With uh, research interests revolving around vision in uh, dim light environments and with a wide arsenal of techniques ranging from electrophysiological to behavioral to theoretical, in his own words, he had the privilege of studying a number of organisms among vertebrates and invertebrates from deep sea uh, cephalopods and fish to nocturnal uh, insects. President of the International Society of Neuroethology, a uh, recipient of many personal awards and author of a number of books, including uh, Visual Ecology, together with Thomas Cronin, Sonke Johnson, and Justin Marshall. It is with great pleasure that I'm leaving the stage for him, Professor Eric Warrant, for a talk entitled Australian Bogong Moths Use a True Stellar Compass for Long Distance Navigation at Nights. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome Professor Warrant. Eric, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, George. Can you hear me? Yes, crystal yeah. clear. Yeah, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. That was very, very nice. And that's very nice to be here. Thanks to you and thanks to Tom and all the organizers of the seminar series. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, just tell me when to share and I- and, Yeah, and I, you can, you can yeah. go ahead, please, Eric. Okay. Okay, with some luck, you can see that, I hope. Is that, is so that visible? We don't see the full screen uh, presentation mode. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the different tabs. Oh, I'm sorry, I've done the wrong one. Indeed, I have, that's right. So how does that look? Splendid. Right. Okay, right. Well, thank you, as, as I said, George. Thank you, Tom. Um, Yes, my talk um, is going to be about a, a curious Australian moth, the Australian Bogong moth, uh, and its ability to navigate over long distances. So um, just to begin, I'm just going to tell you a, a, a couple of things about migratory insects, just a couple of brief things. Firstly, when insects migrate, as many animals do, many animals make enormous migrations um, across the surface of the earth, some shorter and some longer. Uh, when it comes to insects, huge numbers of insects migrate um, and uh, at nighttime over the British Isles, for instance, there are huge um, numbers, millions, of, trillions actually of, of insects which migrate um, over the British Isles uh, at this time and over the summer and during the autumn. But generally, most insects when they migrate tend to migrate from one very broad geographical region to another in search of more favorable conditions, sort of a broad area from a northern part of, of Europe, say, to a broader part of um, northern Africa. Um, but there's no specific actual destination um, attached to that migration. There are, however, two specific species of insects that have been reasonably well studied, and there are very, very few insects that have this behavior, that have a highly specific and, and geographically restricted destination. There are two such species we know of reasonably well, one in particular, and, and that insect we, insect we know particularly well is the monarch butterfly uh, from North America. This is a long range um, day active navigator that um, travels enormous distances, four to 5,000 kilometers uh, in a single direction from the south of Canada and the north of the United States. It travels across um, the United States southwards um, before during the autumn um, uh, before winter arrives in central Mexico to a very, very specific um, mountain area with specific type of vegetation 
where it spends the winter in huge numbers. Um, and there's a picture of it in the next slide here. They congregate on trees um, in vast numbers. It's a very well-known phenomenon. Uh, and we know quite a lot about its migration. Uh, as a day active insect, it relies uh, on several cues, but the major cue that it relies on for navigation as a navigational compass is the sun. Uh, it relies on the sun particularly because it's a very constant and a predictable cue uh, every day for days on end uh, during the migration. It rises in the same place, um, it sets roughly in the same place, and it travels roughly across the same um, trajectory across the sky. And for that reason, um, uh, 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 monarch butterflies have evolved the ability to use the sun as a, as a quite, an, quite an excellent compass actually for keeping a migratory heading towards Mexico. Um, and then back again actually once the um, uh, time in Mexico is over in the spring. The other insect that um, makes such a highly directed migration to a very specific de destination is the Australian bogong moth, um, Agrotus infusa. And this is a, an insect that's very, very well known to Australians, um, like myself. Um, many people in Canberra, where I did my PhD, know much about this moth because it sometimes ends up off a little bit off course, uh, attracted to the lights of Canberra, where in vast numbers they can um, invade public buildings and block uh, ventilation systems, um, cause short circuits, uh, disrupt lift operations and cause what most people would consider to be mayhem. And some people actually find these insects to be quite um, abhorrent as a result of this. But actually, I think they're quite, they're quite delightful and they've got remarkable navigational um, skills, which I'll tell you about today. Now, these insects, like uh, monarch butterflies, they start from an enormous um, starting area um, throughout southeastern Australia. This is their their major migratory um, sort of their migratory routes. So this is a map of Australia, hopefully you recognize here on the left. And on the right, you see these arrows showing where the moths are starting their journeys um, and where they end them during the spring in this particular case. So the moths um, during the winter are going through their egg, larva and pupa stages in the breeding areas. And the breeding areas are spread throughout Western Victoria, Western and Northwestern and Northern New South Wales and Southern and Southeastern Queensland. And they emerge in the early spring as adults and then they begin a very, very long journey of about a thousand kilometers to arrive in Australia's highest mountains, which are the Australian Alpine areas, which extend from Northeastern Victoria to um, uh, South uh, Eastern New South Wales, which you, you see here, and also actually in, in Western, uh, the Western Australian Capital Territory, the small um, sort of territory where, the, where Canberra exists. And so they, they, they arrive in these high mountains, and when they get there, from all different directions, they um, uh, find high alpine caves on the mountain ridges. So this mountain over here at the top you can see, with a bit of snow on the side is Mount Kosciuszko, which is Australia's highest mountain. It's sort of round and, and unobtrusive compared to a lot of other countries' highest mountains, uh, but it's our, our highest mountain. And all around here, including on the side of Mount Kosciuszko, there are a number of piles of, of huge stones which create cave-like hollows and rocky interiors where moths arrive literally in their billions from all over southeastern Australia they, they arrive in these caves, which are dotted along the ridge tops, um, and then they move into these caves and they line the walls of the caves in huge numbers, like, like scales on a fish that you see in this picture on the bottom left. There are about 17,000 of these moths on every square meter of cave wall. So any given cave can, ha can hold um, probably millions or at the most, at least hundreds of thousands of moths in each cave stretched from the Australian Capital Territory down to Victoria. We don't know exactly how many caves there are, but about 50 to 60 caves are currently known in New South Wales. Not every location where you might expect um, moths to be found is occupied. They seem to come back to the same locations every year, and these are very specific locations, specific caves. 
Now at the, they spend now the summer here in these caves in this state and this, this state that they're in is a dormant state known as Estivation. It's a little bit like hibernation except over the summer. So they, they go into a, a, a state of dormancy. They stay in this state in these cool caves for about three to four months. And the same individuals that arrived months earlier then leave the caves and return to where they were born to again mate. When they get there, they may mate, they lay their um, eggs and then they die. And then their offspring develop in the, in the following winter. And in the spring that follows, the adults emerge again and start the entire cycle afresh. Now, the interesting thing about the moths is that they've never been to the mountains before. Nobody's ever showed them how to get there. Uh, their parents have been dead for two or three months. So when they make this journey, they make it for the first time without any assistance. Their ability to find the right direction and travel the right distance is thus inherited from, 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 their, um, from their ancestors. And what exactly they use to find the way um, to know which direction to go in and, how to, and when to stop are uh, questions which are very interesting to us. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Oh, I come to it now, actually. So in other words, how is this remarkable migratory feat achieved? How do they find their way there having never been there before? How do they know the direction to fly? And how do they know when to stop? And to answer these questions, we've been looking over the last few years um, at, at migrant, migrant, migratory moths, uh, both in the spring and in the autumn. So in the autumn, they're on their way down to the mountains um, from various parts of south, southeastern Australia. Um, and in spring, um, if that's in spring, and then in autumn, they're on their way back. So we've had two main locations where we've been studying these moths uh, at a place called Mount Caputar, which is a lovely area in the very north of uh, New South Wales. I can actually go back a couple of shots here and show you. Can you see my arrow moving around here? Um, Mount Caputar is just up here. That's where we study, we've studied them very often in the spring. And in autumn, we've studied them down here at a place called Adam Inaby, which is uh, just below the ACT. Um, and we've studied them during autumn there. And we, what we've done is we, we've put up very powerful light traps in these locations and caught moths during their migration. And once we've caught the moths, often in very large numbers, then we subject them to our experiments directly. Uh, which are both uh, behavioural and electrophysiological, and I'll come to the electrophysiology a little bit later. But the standard method we use is to take moths that we've captured and then attach a tungsten tether to their backs with, a, with contact cement, so it's not invasive. Um, it's attached in such a way that, as you see up here in the right-hand corner, that the, the, the moth is able to fly on the other end of the tether um, we're going to mount that tether with the moth into a special kind of flight arena, which allows the moth to fly. I'll come to that in, in just a second. But the point of, of this apparatus is that the moth is free to move in any direction, 360 degrees around its dorsal body axis, but it can't move from this location. So it can move in any direction relative to north here. Um, and we can, it turns out we can track that with our arena. And this is behavioral work that's being done by post, my postdoc, David Dreyer, um, who's done an excellent job on the behavioral work. And so this is the type of, of, of apparatus that, that we are using. Um, so as I said, we place the um, moth on the end of a stalk here, a tungsten stalk. You can see that it rotates around. You'll also see underneath there's a pattern of optic flow that's flowing always from the nose of the animal to its tail, irrespective of what direction the moth is flying. So you see it rotating around there as the moth rotates around. It's very, very bright here, so you can see it. But normally in the experiment, when, when it's inside the arena, this optic flow is at starlight intensities, it's extremely dim. We can't see it easily ourselves. This arena with the moth is sitting on top of a small table. Uh, in our first experiments, which I'll tell you about first, it, that we, we've, we've done this out under the open sky outside. So it's sitting on a table. Underneath is a 45 degree mirror, which reflects from a projector, reflects up onto the underside of the arena, onto a piece of tracing paper here on the on this perspex, perspex um, topped table, it projects that optic flow underneath the arena, and that's where we generate it actually. Um, and then we have, in addition, a thing up here at the top of the arena known as an optical encoder. 
And that optical encoder eventually um, is attached to that shaft. And the optical encoder's job is to register five times every second the actual heading of the moth relative to north. So five times a second, we know exactly what the heading of that moth is relative to north. So over a period of time, it's possible for us to build up a kind of um, virtual trajectory, if you like. So here's one such trajectory over five minutes. So one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, and five minutes. That's a relatively well-directed moth um, that was flying for the most part just east of north. We can characterize that trajectory by a vector. And I'm going to show you these vectors in other diagrams. So take note of this now. This orange vector has a length and a direction. The direction, obviously, is a reflection of the main direction that the moth flew it, during its five-minute trajectory. The length of the vector is a measure of its directedness, that is, its tendency to want to fly in that direction. The longer the vector, the more directed the flight. Of course, some moths aren't very directed at all and might have a trajectory that looks more like that, in which case the, the vector has a very short length and is, is um, going to indicate some, some direction between the start and the end of, of that trajectory, but whether it significantly um, represents the average direction uh, is questionable. So it's, this would probably be representative of a highly undirected moth, in fact, which this trajectory would suggest. So this is the type of individual, uh, the information we can get from an individual moth. Normally, however, we are interested in looking at the, um, com the population behavior of a group of moths. Here's an example of 10 moths that we've placed into our arena. And here you see the 10 orange vectors that have resulted for, from their 10 uh, virtual flight directory um, uh, trajectories, which we've recorded in the arena. So here you see a group of them. So some moths are quite um, directed and have a particular direction. Others, as you see down here, are quite undirected and have what is probably almost a random direction, actually. Um, and you can take, you can account then for both the directions and the directednesses of each one of those, in this case, 10 individual moths, and work out an average population vector for that population that accounts for both the directedness of, of each moth and the direction of each moth. And when you do that, you get this nice red vector here that has a particular length. And the length of that vector has um, statistical significance. And that statistical significance is, is actually shown by dotted circles in these plots. Okay, so in this particular case, we have three dotted circles, each of which represents a different um, uh, level of significance. Uh, P is less than 0 0.05, P is less than 0 0.01, and P is less than 0 0.001. And if the vector breaks through any of those um, circles, it will obtain that degree of significance. In this case, the average population vector for this population is very significant um, because it's broken through the outer P is less than 0 0.001 circle. And it has a direction which indicates the population was going just west of north with reasonably high significance. In a, um, another set of 10 moths here, we see that the moths are neither very directed, nor do they have a common direction. And the average red vector, the population mean vector for that group of 10 moths, uh, doesn't even reach the innermost P uh, significance um, circle here. In fact, the p-value for that population is between 0.5 and 0.9. Uh, indicating that, that that population is undirected. There is no significant direction that population is moving. And you're going to see quite a number of plots like this now in this talk. So just to, to, to note that that's um, the kind of basis of our behavioral data. So here we have the um, results of a natural experiment where we've simply um, had a population, in this case, of 18 moths at Mount Caputa in spring up here in northern New South Wales and a population of 36 moths at, um, caught in the mountains and tested near Adaminibi in autumn. These are natural, pop, um, this is just natural behavior under the open sky in our open arena, viewing the sky on the table, in, just as I showed you in the picture earlier. And those 18 moths caught at Mount Caputar in spring have a, a population vector here, the red vector here, which is highly significantly oriented to a direction which is just west of south, which is 
roughly what you would expect for that a population wanting to make it down to the mountains. So that's roughly what you'd expect, which is which is quite um, um, comforting to see. And then in autumn, the population that we recorded from here was moving um, also very significantly to the northwest, roughly. Uh, we have no a priori knowledge of which group of moths we've sampled here. They could be going in any direction back to Western Victoria or Western New South Wales or Southern Queensland. This particular population, however, seemed to be going northwest um, and they did so with a highly significant uh, um, mean population vector. So in other words, under an open sky with a view of the, of the stars at night um, and any other cue that they might be using, such as the Earth's magnetic field, as we'll come back to in a moment, um, they seem to be doing roughly what you'd expect, which is which is very good news. They, they seem to be able to reverse their directions from spring to autumn and head where they should be during their migration in those two seasons. So the next question, obviously, we want to investigate then, if they have this highly directed behaviour um, in an appropriate direction, as it would seem, in spring and autumn, what sensory cues do Bogong moths actually use to find that direction? There are, at night, several cues available, um, and these are cues which we already know nocturnally migrating birds use, um, and these are magnetic cues from the Earth's magnetic field. That's one possibility. The other possible set of cues that they could be using are visual cues, and they could be either terrestrial landmarks, uh, they could be celestial cues, uh, such as the moon and the stars. Any of these are possible cues for long distance navigation. And indeed, they're, as I said, they're used by nocturnal birds actually that migrate great distances. So to do this experiment, we first decided to test their ability to possibly use the Earth's magnetic field. And for this experiment, we took our arena, which you've seen before, and we placed it in a set of magnetic coils, which has the possibility of turning the Earth's magnetic field by in different directions. So in other words, it can turn it from the natural north-south direction to other directions. It could, for instance, we could, with this apparatus, turn the field lines so that they point east-west if we wanted to. In our experiment, what we did is turn the magnetic field by 120 degrees. So from zero degrees, which is north-south, to a, to a direction which is sort of um, 120 degrees clockwise to that sort of almost southeast. And our Experimental hope here was, in our first experiments, that if one were to turn the um, azimuthal direction of a natural geomagnetic field, so I forgot to point out, by the way, we're doing nothing to the field, we're preserving the Earth's magnetic field to be exactly the same field as present at this site in Australia, so the same inclination angle, that is the angle of the field lines relative to the, to the surface of the Earth, the same magnetic field strength, exactly identical. Um, all we're doing is turning the azimuth of the field. So the question here is, if we turn the field uh, in this way, do Burgon moths follow while they're flying in the arena? Do they follow suit and also turn with the field or do they not do that? We know already that if you do such an experiment with nocturnally migrating birds, which are restricted to these famous Emlyn funnels, it's a kind of a, uh, a, a lined funnel with um, a, a white paper that can be scratched by the birds and they will scratch more on one side and leave these black marks if they want to go in that direction. Uh, and when inside magnetic coils, um, people have found in the past, that if they rotate the Earth's magnetic field in coils, they will also turn the direction that the birds are scratching in these funnels. So we had that hope that this might work. But sadly, after two entire years of field work, um, that did not happen. We could not get them to turn in the, in the field in this way. In fact, most of the time they didn't do anything at all, these moths. They just kept on heading in the same direction. If they did react, they often went in directions which were not in, absolutely had nothing to do with the direction of the turned field. And, and after a while, we just had to suddenly go back to the drawing board and have a bit of a think. And what is actually quite surprising, and this is always good in, in hindsight, is that you should never be sold on your own experiment as we were with the magnetic one. Because one of the things that, of course, I should have realized having worked on nocturnal vision insects my entire life basically is that moths and other nocturnal insects have exquisite vision they have incredibly um, sensitive vision and so a moth in our arena viewing the world above will see an enormous number of visual cues as well they will see these coils for instance from within the arena they'll see this 
this Perspex bar, most likely, hanging across the top of the arena, holding the um, optical encoder to the shaft to which it's attached to in the middle of our arena. So there's a lot of things it could see. It could also, of course, see the stars. And these are all totally invariant stimuli when we turn the field. So they are maintained. If in addition, there are wobbles and, 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 and uh, other um, visual cues inside the arena itself, along the walls of the arena, those could potentially be seen by the moth as well. All of these could be used as orientation cues and they might prefer to look at those and keep flying in a particular direction than to take any notice at all of our magnetic field that we've applied. So to get around this problem, when we suddenly realized this, we decided to introduce our own extremely dominant visual field of uh, visual cues and attempt to get rid of all um, extraneous visual cues that we could. So what we did is we lined the bottom of our arena with a black horizon um, and we put a little mountain top on top of that horizon, which we could move. So we could move that mountain top around actually to different locations. We also had a disc of um, UV transmission, transmissive um, tracing paper, which we attached to the shaft, shaft above the moth. It didn't restrict its movements at all. It was just um, sitting against the, 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 um, uh, the, we had a tube around the shaft actually to protect the shaft. So we attached it to that, that protective um, tube. Um, and we placed a stripe on there because we had no a priori knowledge of which part of the visual field the animal might be using visual cues to, 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 to navigate. So we placed a black stripe on that piece of, of circular tracing paper as well. And we pointed it at the top of the mountain. And we had the ability to rotate that disc as well. So we could move the mountain top, we could rotate the disc and thus rotate this black stripe. So now we had the possibility to do another experiment and we now made a 20 minute experiment on each moth where we, ex we subjected them to five minutes of visual and magnetic cues. In the first experiment, the um, apparatus was as I showed it in the previous um, slide. So we placed the moth on the end of the tether. We had the magnetic field in its natural direction, north, south. And then we placed the um, visual landmarks at 60 degrees to that direction. So 60 degrees east of north. So we had the stripe and the mountain top at 60 degrees with the stripe pointing at the top of the mountain top for five minutes. And we recorded then the virtual fright um, director, um, uh, trajectory of, of moths in that circumstance. After five minutes, then we, we switched the field by 120 degrees. We rotated the field by 120 degrees into the southeast sector. At the same time, we moved the visual cues also uh, by 120 degrees. So now the visual cues, uh, the mountaintop you see here as seen through the side of the arena, the stripe is also again pointing at the top of the mountain. So everything was moved. So everything changed together. In the third five minute period, what we then did was we left the visual cues where they were in the second phase, which we've called phase B. And in this phase, which we've called phase C, we turned the field back to where it was at the beginning. So in other words, back to north south. So here what we've done is introduced a cue conflict so that the visual cues and the magnetic cues are now no longer in the state that the moth has learned them to be in at the start of the experiment. And to make sure that the moth returns um, to the original condition, we repeat the first phase, phase A, again in phase D. These two phases uh, have exactly the same stimulus conditions. And these are the, res the results that we obtained. So in the first experiment with 42 moths in this case, the 42 moths of this population here, each moth shown by a black vector whose length and direction again, uh, um, showing the um, a representative of the trajectory of each moth. And here you see for this population of 42 moths in that stimulus um, setup, a, a mean population vector that is pointing, the, the population is pointing just to the east of that set of landmarks. If we now rotate both the magnetic field and the visual landmarks by 120 degrees, the population of moths moves exactly by the same number of degrees. So the, the angle between these two mean vectors, both of which are highly significant, um, they cross this P is less than 0 0.01 um, um, uh, dotted line. 
um, they move exactly as you would predict on the basis of the movement of these two cues, magnetic and visual. In the cue conflict situation, when we move the uh, magnetic field back to the original direction again, then the moths, after a while, it takes two minutes roughly for them to lose it once we've made this change. But after two minutes, the moths become completely disoriented. So in other words, you see here, there is no visible uh, red vector anymore that describes that population. They are completely disoriented. If we then go to the final um, uh, condition, which is a repeat of phase A, then you'll see that the population returns very significantly to the situation that it was in at the start of the experiment. So in other words, they just didn't get tired by phase C and start doing um, silly things because they were tired. The Q conflict here, which involved nothing more than turning the magnetic field by 120 degrees back to where it was initially, that single change alone caused the moth population to become totally disoriented. So the results of this experiment suggest that, or shall I go back here first? The results of this experiment suggest two things. Um, first, it suggests that these moths do indeed have the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field because this particular change in the, uh, if, the if the moths were only um, uh, orienting themselves um, according to the visual landmarks, a change in the magnetic field alone would not have changed their behavior. But because they became totally disoriented when we changed the field, um, that implies that they're able to sense the Earth's magnetic field and use it for steering this migratory flight behavior. That's the first conclusion. The second conclusion is that they somehow seem to be using, therefore, a correlation between visual and magnetic cues to hold their direction, to stay as, as an oriented um, uh, animal. And so we, uh, this is all written up in more detail with a lot of controls as well, I have to say. I, haven't had, I don't have the time to show you all the controls, but we know that this is actually a real, a real behavior here from the controls. Um, but with those controls, we've come to the conclusion um, or we've made the hypothesis actually, that for Burgon moths, it suggests that their navigational strategy that they're using is possibly something a little bit like what we might use if we go for a hike with a map. So if we want to travel somewhere when we're hiking, if we want to say go northeast, then we take a magnetic um, compass out of our pocket, we work out which direction northeast is, and then we look for something in the distance, like a distant um, mountain peak or some other landmark that we then decide to walk towards and put the magnetic compass back in our pocket. So it's almost as though maybe the Bogong moths are doing something similar. That they're using a visual, they might be using a visual cue or a visual landmark as a kind of a navigational beacon, which they then check with, check the fidelity of every few minutes with a with a um, with their magnetic with a magnetic compass. Um, this few minutes, uh, comes from the fact that it seems to take two, well, about two minutes for them to realize that the Q conflict has occurred before they start becoming extremely disoriented. That data is all in that, um, that paper, that current biology paper whose reference I showed earlier. So that would imply then that visual and magnetic cues are very important during this navigation that the Bogong moths are doing um, to arrive in the mountains. They obviously have a magnetic sense. So the question then is, what are the visual cues that are being used by the moth? Um, and our first question to, that we asked, um, which is what I'm going to show you now for the rest of the talk, is whether it might be possible that the scary night sky could act as a kind of a landmark, if you like, if you like to refer to celestial objects as landmarks, could they be a beacon? Temp could they function as temporary beacons for navigation in this way, where those beacons are, calibrated against a magnetic compass uh, to, to migrate over a longer distance. And to do these experiments, we needed much more controlled conditions. So what we did was a couple of years ago, we built a lab uh, on land. Actually, I'm, I must admit, I already own since um, 20 years in the snowy mountains of Australia in Adaminibi. This is why we've used Adaminibi as the location for our um, our, our experiments. My family and I have had a house there um, since the early 2000s, which you can see up here on the hill. I can see it over here as well. And next, just down the hill from the, um, from the house, which we now use as a kind of accommodation and field station, 
we built a lab out of entirely non-magnetic materials. So everything in this building is non-magnetic, including the roof, uh, all of the, the structure of the building. It's obviously made out of timber, which isn't magnetic. All of the uh, concrete slab that is built on, all the reinforcing is made out of fiberglass and not iron. So there are, there's no possibility to get magnetic artifacts in here from, from uh, magnetic materials, which is very important for, this, uh, for these experiments. And what we did was we set up two setups in here, one behavioral setup, which I'll tell you about first, and then, uh, and also an electrophysiological setup, both of which are entirely non-magnetic. Uh, electrophysiological setup is non-magnetic, and so is the behavioral setup. So here is the behavioral setup. And now we, instead of having a single axis of coils, we've got um, a three dimensional set of coils, an X, Y, and Z set of coils, completely surrounding our behavioral arena, which you can't see here. It's actually inside this black curtain, uh, but here you can see it opened up. This was during construction. So it's looking a little bit messy at the moment. So uh, normally it's a little bit tidier than this, but here is our, our, our arena barrel. Here is the tabletop with a tracing paper as normal. Um, in this arena, we have a lid on top of the arena, which holds the optical encoder at its center. So the shaft uh, holding the moth is attached to the encoder. And so the moth is still as normal um, down in the middle of this arena, flying on the end of its tether. This lid that we've um, put on here is a UV translucent lid with a UV translucent um, circular piece of tracing paper which we use as a projector screen for a projector, which we mount on an aluminium frame on top of the coil. So here you see the projector up here and using the free planetarium software, which you, everybody can download onto their computer called Stellarium. Um, we were able to project um, highly realistic night sky images um, of the outside sky at the exact date and at the exact time of our experiment inside the arena here of our um, behavioral apparatus. So this, this, um, this program Stellarium is quite amazing. You can, you can actually project any starry sky at any location on the earth at any time of night on any date. And so we just dialed up Adam Inabi, right date, right time, and use that starry sky on the lid of the arena in the right season, obviously. So the sky during autumn and the sky during spring are different actually. So um, we use those two, two different skies. So the experiments that we did then, um, oh, actually there's one thing I should mention. The reason why we've got the arena inside the coils is not to stimulate with a, a magnetic field, but now actually to completely remove the earth's magnetic field. So we've got the possibility to make a magnetic vacuum inside the our arena. And that's very important for these experiments because we don't want any confounding effect of the magnetic field and the magnetic sense. So we effectively knock out the magnetic sense by getting rid of the stimulus here. Um, and so all of the experiments I'm about to describe to you now are done without a magnetic field. So the magnetic sense has been disabled to study the, the visual sense in isolation. So here we have um, the stimuli that we used in spring and in autumn and a control. So here is the natural orientation of the spring sky. And this is what the image would look like above the moths. Here we have the natural projection of the autumn sky above the moths. N is north here. Then we also have a control sky that we've made where we've taken every one of these stars and moved them around randomly across the, the image so that we get rid of any spatial information that might arise from the Milky Way, but we maintain the brightness of the image the same. So it's the same brightness. So everything is the same, except there's no spatial information from the stars anymore. Then we have the ability to rotate that image as well. So in the experiments I'm about to show you, we also rotated the night sky by 180 degrees and the control sky actually as well, uh, all skies. So we could make the, the sky such that north pointed south, both in spring and in autumn. Then we got a population of moths and we put them in the arena, no magnetic um, field, um, complete, completely free of all visual cues apart from the um, projected night sky above. And what we found is doing nothing at all, just letting them fly underneath the, um, that starry night sky in spring. It's a population of 70 moths this is done over two separate years in two spring seasons, these 70 moths. And as you'll see, they're highly significantly directed to a direction in this case of just east of south. 
So this is roughly the predicted migratory direction you'd expect for spring migrants um, attempting to come to the mountains, uh, in this case from a northward direction, it turns out. If then we rotate the sky by 180 degrees, that entire population um, turns around and goes back in the opposite direction. So in other words, I don't recall the exact angular change here, but it's almost 180 degrees plus minus about five or six degrees. So the population uh, mean vectors switch directions when we wrote by almost 180 degrees, when we turn the sky by 180 degrees. If we show the control sky, the jumbled starry sky instead, the population is completely disoriented. So in other words, this population of moths has been able to locate its inherited migratory direction under the starry night sky we project alone in the absence of all other visual cues and in the absence of the Earth's magnetic field, um, which was quite a, um, a surprising result to us. When we repeated the experiment in autumn instead under the autumn night sky, which looks a little different, um, this time now from at, at Adaminabe, we're studying migrants returning. Under the natural night sky, a population in this case of 54 moths taken over two autumns, over two years, that population of moths is also heading in, an, in, in, a, in, a, in a direction that um, you'd expect for, for moths migrating to the breeding areas. If we also now turn that sky by 180 degrees, the population of moths turns also by 180 degrees, roughly. Uh, again, it's 180 degrees plus minus five degrees. Uh, I don't have the number in my head exactly. And once again, if you um, have that population under a, um, a random sky, the population is completely disoriented. So in other words, both in spring and in um, autumn, it seems that this population, these the bogon moths seem to be able to use the starry night sky um, as a, a kind of a true compass, if you like, to find their inherited migratory direction relative to north. So in other words, the conclusion from this that we've come to is that the, the, the sky, the night sky is simply not just a visual landmark. It seems that they really are able to use it as a, as a kind of true compass to coarsely discern north, south, east and west and thus find their correct migratory direction in different seasons. And um, it turns out also, and this is work of Andrea Adam, who is now um, doing a, a, her postdoc with, um, uh, with Tom's partner in London, uh, Lucia. Um, she is uh, the responsible for this work. It was part of her PhD. Um, and the uh, work that she did during her PhD was to now study cells in the brain of the moth that might be involved in this, this compass navigation, this stellar compass um, that we've, we've found behaviorally. And what she's found in her PhD is that there are indeed visual cells that respond exclusively to the starry night sky. And these are found in the central brain and in the central complex of the Bogong moth. And just to introduce that uh, area, the central complex, um, the central complex, so for those of you who've never heard of it, uh, it's a, a, a central region of the brain, which is um, has been a, a hot area of research actually over the last, I would say roughly 20 years. This region of the brain, at the very center of the insect brain, is highly conserved across different insects. And it's a region of the brain which is used to um, process different types of sensory information which is being gathered by an animal during locomotion and to turn that information into steering commands. In other words, um, the central complex is highly involved in um, uh, helping animals to stay on a given course by analyzing how the animal itself has changed the sensory input and then to correct any changes in course that the animal may have experienced in order to put the animal back on course again. In other words, it's involved with kind of, of steering and not surprisingly, therefore the central complex um, houses the kind of compass circuits, if you like, for those animals that have different types of compasses. For instance, the monarch butterfly sun compass network is found also in the central complex. So um, Andrea, during her PhD, went looking for the cells in the non-magnetic electrophysiological setup 
Um, and I'll come to that in just a second. I'll show you that setup. But uh, here is a slightly more detailed view of the Vogon Moth Central Complex. This is the entire brain, including the optic lobe regions of the brain going to each eye, which house all of the visual processing centers of um, the brain. In the center of the brain, as I say, we have the central complex rec, um, uh, shown here in these colored regions, uh, here blown up to see the different regions. I won't go into these different regions at all, apart from to say that there, it's a very sophisticated part of the brain, um, uh, which um, houses a great many different types of neurons that have different roles in this compass and steering net network. Here is the uh, non-magnetic electrophysiological setup during um, its construction. So again, it's looking a little bit messy, uh, but you can see everything quite clearly. It too has a set of magnetic coils around it for in the case of the experiments that Andrea did to also null the Earth's magnetic field so that we have a magnetic field inside the electrophysiological setup. Uh, we have a, a bogong moth, which we place on the stand there and we impale cells in the brain with electrodes um, and using uh, what you don't see in this particular um, diagram or this photo here uh, is that we have not yet installed a circular screen and a projector and a mount for the projector above the coils where we can also um, project the uh, starry night sky above the moth and rotate it just as we did in the behavioral setup. So the two setups are, are, are really quite similar, except one does behavior and one does electrophysiology, but on the stimulus side, they're identical actually. And um, Andrea's work, and, uh, and we've got a lot of data at the moment that um, Andrea is still analyzing that we're hoping to write up rather soon. But here is some of the earlier data that um, Andrea has analyzed showing uh, a typical, in this case, an un unidentified central complex. So we don't know which one this is. The, the dye injection didn't work for this, but it shows um, action potentials from the cell in response to rotations of the um, night sky, either clockwise or anti-clockwise in this case. And what you see is a quite significant change in the frequency of, of, of action potentials during the course of that rotation. Uh, here you see, for instance, rotations of the starry night sky versus rotations of the control sky, that random star um, sky, which we used for the control in the behavioral experiment. Uh, Andrea has also used even in the electrophysiological experiment. And what you see here is that there's a very clear um, direction of rotation, well, particular rotational uh, or angular position of the night sky, which gives a maximal response from the cell. In this particular case, there's another region which gives a minimal response. And, and Andreas now analyzed a lot of these cells and, and found very many similar types of cells that do similar things. And here is a, uh, a kind of a summary of some of those cells. This is an earlier slide. And here you see five such cells, um, which have also been injected with dye and, and, and identified. Um, and here you see their um, uh, action potential, their, their, their spike frequency as a function of sky rotation angle, both for the natural sc starry sky being rotated in the darker curves and these paler blue curves show the, show the response of the cell to a, a rotating control sky. Um, Experiments I haven't, I haven't got time to show you now. Andrea has also done a lot of uh, control experiments where we've looked at different types of stimuli like bars and blobs rotating above the animal as well uh, as controls. And we're still analyzing that data. But the take home message from all of that is that these cells truly seem to be tuned to uh, Milky Way-like stimuli and respond very strongly to them. And we think that they've somehow in, they're somehow involved in this compass circuit that's analyzing stellar information. Uh, and we're still working on exactly what that circuitry looks like. And it's probably going to be a project that will go for some time yet. So to finish or to conclude, um, Bogon moths um, seem to have a, uh, an ability to use the starry night sky in Australia as a, as a true stellar compass to navigate. And as far as we know, only two other groups of animals are known to be able to use stars for navigation. And they, those are humans, ourselves, uh, who have harnessed stars for navigation. Um, and also some species of night migratory songbirds are able to use constellations of stars and particularly uh, the pole star uh, for navigation um, at night. Uh, so this is pretty amazing, I think, um, that an invertebrate with a tiny brain and extremely small eyes 
the brain has a volume about the, the volume of a grain of rice. Uh, but uh, despite that, it's able to not only sense the Earth's magnetic field and, and possibly use that as a compass, but even uh, it's even able to, to use the stars to navigate as well, which is a, which is a pretty amazing thing for, for such a, a tiny um, animal. Um, and apparently, for many people, a very annoying and rather drab animal. But for me, that's one of the most amazing insects I know. So finally, um, and this is all just a hypothesis, of course, it could be the case that bogong moths combine the types of sensory information that they've got access to at night, uh, information from the stars, information from the Earth's magnetic field, and even um, beacon information from distant landmarks, which they can follow until they no longer become useful. If they pass them or uh, they lose sight of them, they can hook onto new landmarks as they become available after calibrating them, say, against the magnetic field of the Earth. So we think that these three things together probably create an extremely robust navigational system at night when conditions are very difficult for a, not, for a migratory animal. They don't have the benefit of having something like the sun as an incredibly reliable and constant type of, of, of cue that a day active animal has access to. They, 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 they need to make use of things which are a little less um, reliable, both in terms of visual reliability and in terms of uh, having to use a magnetic compass, which seems to be also um, a tricky thing to use as found with many other animals. But, but uh, that's another story. Um, so finally, the conclusions then are that um, bogong moths seem to be able to sense the Earth's magnetic field um, and use it in conjunction with visual landmarks to steer migratory flight. Uh, they also seem to possess a true stellar compass for navigating uh, in their inherited migratory direction during each season, both towards the mountains in spring and away from the mountains in autumn. Um, they also possess visual cells in the central brain and central complex, which respond exclusively to rotations of the Australian night sky. Uh, and of course, those rotations, I forgot to mention, uh, the, obviously the sky isn't rotating above them when they're stationary. The only reason they experience rotations of the sky is that they themselves are probably rotating around their dorsal body axis if they change direction. So those rotations are potentially useful to them to correct a course that they may have deviated from. Uh, and finally, the last conclusion is that together, the stars, the Earth's magnetic field and temporary visual landmarks very likely create a robust compass system for long distance navigation at night in this animal. And with that, I thank you all very, very much for your attention. And of course, to uh, European Research Council, uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, uh, our own Science Council here in Sweden, and our local Royal Society here in Lund, the Royal Physiographic Society for their support of all of this work. And of course, um, a great thanks to my many co-authors who are the ones who've done the great lion's share of the work I presented in this talk today. But thank you very much and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much Eric. Such a fascinating uh, talk and such an incredible uh, task that these small bodied tiny brained guys are managing to perform and I wonder like if bio-inspired solutions like that try to be neuromorphic and you know stick to the size constraints will ever be able to uh, compute uh, something like that um, just to remind to our audience uh, that they can post their questions in the chat uh, or they can ask them in person uh, maybe in 10-15 minutes from now in the post uh, talk uh, zoom session that we always uh, hold um, I would like to thank you once again um, and it, it looks convenient to have, you know, some pieces of land if you want to build your own <laughs> lab on site, literally on site. Uh, I have a couple uh, of questions of mine, but I will stick to the ones that appear uh, in the chat for the time being. Uh, first one is from Tom Baden. Uh, your migratory map suggests that different populations of moths travel to different bits of Australia with a different angle relative to, relative to all landmarks. Is following these angular offsets inherited? That's an extremely good question and actually is the um, topic of a PhD thesis in Australia right at this moment. So um, <clears throat> I have a student, uh, a, 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 a fellow called Jesse Wallace at the Australian National University who as one of his main projects actually is to, to do a populations genetic study on populations of moths from different breeding areas. So he's looking very much at the two extremes. So populations from extreme Western Victoria, uh, which travel 
more or less eastwards to get to the mountains and populations um, in southeastern, sorry, northeastern Australia, uh, northeastern New South Wales and southeastern Queensland that have to travel more or less southwest to get to the mountains. So the answer is that that must be inherited. Exactly how, um, we don't know yet, but it could be um, some kind of epigenetic thing as well um, that is inherited. But I'm just talking through my hat here because we don't know yet, but it's a good question and we're certainly following that up. Mm -hmm. Uh, next one up is uh, Simon Laughlin. Uh, do the moths determine the direction of their track over the ground to compensate for transverse uh, winds? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, yeah. We unfortunately we I didn't get we didn't get the money for this, but I had a, a, a postdoc who is an expert on um, using LIDAR techniques for detecting insects across the ground. And we had a, a plan to actually look at some of these questions with vertical LIDAR to track them in natural conditions to try and actually answer exactly mm -hmm. these types of questions. How well are, they, um, are these moths able to navigate in real world conditions with real winds uh, that we know the directions of? I mean, we can work out where they should be going, but then we need to be able to find out whether they actually are able to, to hold these directions and what they do um, when, when they're faced with adverse conditions like this. So the answer is, Simon, I'm afraid I don't know at the moment offhand what those um, what the answer to that question is. I assume they can, but exactly how well and how they do it, I'm not sure. Thank you very much for addressing this. Uh, I should clarify there are a lot of people uh, congratulating you for the talk and thanking you for the talk. I assume you cannot see it because you are not uh, logged in in the YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, part. Thank you. <laughs> Next one is uh, like actually three questions from uh, Gregor Belusic. Uh, I will start with the first one chronologically. Amazing. Congrats. Uh, is the EFIS setup considered as non-magnetic in spite of the Thorlabs anti-vibrational table below the coils? Uh, don't the potentially ferromagnetic parts below count? No, there is, that isn't actually, just to, to answer Gregor, that, that isn't actually a anti-vibration table. Uh, they're made of aluminium parts. Every single piece is made of aluminium or high grade marine stainless steel. Um, yeah, so now we've been very careful about that. We haven't actually used an anti-magnetic, uh, sorry, anti-vibration, uh, special anti-vibration breadboard here. Uh, which do have magnetic par parts in them, that's true. What we have done though is searched on the internet for um, damping devices which are non-magnetic and we found these extremely expensive damping devices which um, hi-fi freaks put their uh, highly expensive amplifiers on so that people who enter the, the same room as, as um, they're sitting in listening to music don't cause vibrations that disturb the music. These things are very expensive and they're incredibly damping of vibrations and they're totally non-magnetic. Uh, they're made of ceramics and high grade, marine grade stainless steel. So uh, that's how we've got rid of the, um, the, the magnetic field, uh, sort of magnetic artifacts in the, in the setup. So it truly is completely non-magnetic. Our manipulators that we had custom built by um, Sense Apex in Finland are also completely non-magnetic. Mm -hmm. um, the second question is, have you ever had the chance uh, to try the experiments in completely naive moths, just uh, enclosed? Um, oh, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by that. In naive in the sense of, they're pretty naive because we just grab them out of the sky basically and do the experiments. <laughs> Maybe not the same night, but... Um, I, maybe they could clarify exactly what they mean. Yeah, by... yeah. that's what I was uh, considering suggesting. Like, um, yeah. Gregor, if you want, like, you can either clarify uh, in the chat or join us. I already posted the uh, Zoom room link and people uh, start already to join us here. Uh, I will not stop the live transmission just yet. And before I continue with the third uh, question, uh, just a reminder for the audience that next week we are hosting uh, Nathan Morehouse for um, a talk about the evolution of vision in jumping spiders. Uh, and getting back to the third and last question from uh, Gregor, you, um, you've mentioned that the projection plates were UV transparent. Any comments on this? Have you tried uh, visible only stimulation? 
I assume. Ah, that. okay. Yeah, not no, not yet. So if if Gregor's question is asking whether we've investigated the um, wavelength region where the magnetic sense might be working or not working, we haven't specifically done that yet. But that's certainly planned. So that the idea um, is that if it's a cryptochrome-based mechanism, it's probably working mostly within a certain wavelength range, possibly blue. Um, and we've, we've, so far, we've um, given them broad spe spectrum uh, light. So the starry night sky has got UV in it too. I forgot to mention that. So it's got all wavelengths from UV to visible. Um, and not because of the projector, because that couldn't do UV, but we've provided extra UV um, um, from outside to to make up for that that loss, so so the moths are able to get all wavelengths from UV um, to well to red, which probably doesn't see so well, but um, yeah, and all of it goes through that that lid. Mm -hmm. uh, Gregor clarified saying like the moth just out of the pupa, so like naive in that oh. sense, like oh 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 I see right um, no we no that's not as easy to do because then you have to actually be lucky and be right where they are when they emerge from the soil out in the breeding areas. And, um, and I must admit, we, we haven't done that experiment. Uh, that would be a very difficult experiment to do probably uh, because we'd have to get access to the moths as you know, just prior to them hatching from the ground. I guess it's not impossible. We'd have to go out and dig them up, dig them up in, out in far western New South Wales, drive them back to Adaminabe and, and hatch them out there. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea, actually, but I must admit we haven't we haven't done that. No. Interesting. Thank you very much. So there is another one from Tom. There are already uh, a lot of people here. So may I remind to the audience that I will be stopping live transmission in a couple of minutes. So in case you want to tag along for the informal part of our uh, vision series, please make sure to follow the link that uh, appears in the chat. Uh, before I ask Tom's question, I have one of my own. Uh, so I would like to step in. Maybe it's naive, but um, you tried like to uh, like to have controls like for the Milky Way, and you tried to rotate it to 180 degrees. But did you also try like when we talk about the spring uh, migration? Did you try to present the autumn Milky Way to see if we have more migration, like more uh, uh, census integration? Yeah, no, we haven't come that far. These are a lot of experiments that we've wanted to do, but we because of COVID, we haven't been able to go back. So, um, yeah, many of these things that you've just mentioned now, George, are things on our, on our books to do, but mm -hmm. we've just missed our second two month field season. And we're supposed to, we're supposed to be going back in, in October, but I, I, I really am not sure we can. So yeah, no, it's getting a bit frustrating. I have to admit, <laughs> a bit depressing actually. Yeah, so, so the answer is no. And all of these experiments are, Obvious. The other experiment we want to do as well is, is obviously now to include the Earth's magnetic field and find out whether together the, the stars and the magnetic field together give a tighter distribution of moths in the setup than we've seen with the, with the stars alone. Maybe it's the case that the moths are much better aligned uh, mm -hmm. and with less spread um, than with the stars alone. And then we can also try, if we can do this, to try and have the mag magnetic field alone but that's going to be more tricky to do because if they latch onto any tiny little visual cue, then uh, we may end up with the problem we had earlier with our two years of failed experiments. <laughs> <laughs> um, so returning back to Tom and his second uh, question that attempts to generalize, like to contextualize also everything. Uh, you mentioned that only these moths, some birds and humans use stars to navigate. Can you speculate if this is because we haven't looked broadly enough or do you think it is really this exclusive? It could be either. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, now that an insect can do it, I mean, I, it, it's not necessarily out of the question that other invertebrates could do it. I guess it's a case of finding an, um, an animal that would get some use from it. So, I mean, being able to use the stars to navigate like this makes sense if you have to travel a long way at night. Um, and so any animal that does something like that has to travel a very long way a, a, in a very specific direction at night is a candidate for this. Uh, and the question is, what animals would they be? Um, I, I must admit off the top of my head, I can't think of a nocturnal insect at least that would, is, is doing this. Uh, I can think of a few more day active ones. So there are some other moth species that may do it actually. 
Um, there's a moth in North America that does a shorter, a shorter migration of this type, and one in Japan as well, uh, also noctuids, um, that does a shorter version of the same thing. Uh, they may have some use of it, um, but again, they would be another noctuid moth. So I don't know whether you find it outside of noctuid moths or not. You'd, you'd have to find an insect that had a, a behavior like this that would be worthwhile having a, a, a stellar compass for. I just saw that Tom mentioned here in this uh, Zoom room chat that uh, Xenopus, they have huge migrations. Oh, is that right? Uh huh. Okay, as adults, I assume. <laughs> yeah. Great. So um, I think I will uh, be stopping the live transmission so we can stay offline, like for this uh, post talk uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much once again, um, Eric. Uh, for this wonderful talk uh, and thank you very much to everyone out there for uh, following our Sussex Vision series uh, as always within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative make sure uh, to join um, the Zoom room if you wish the link is uh, available uh, on your screens thank you thank you very much George and thanks everyone